Lord, we thank you for these words, Lord, that challenge us, uh, challenge us to do better and be better, Lord, and to know that where our heart is, our heart should and ought to be with you. So we thank you for all the people here, Lord. Let them continue to bless uh, the church. Let them bless the work that the church does. And ultimately, Lord, bless them in giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm doing something this year. I, I had two weeks to kind of fill in between all these lectures and slide presentations, which I really enjoy doing. Uh, uh, the, the slides and doing these presentations really put kind of form and substance into a lot of what Scripture tells us. So uh, I, I sure you, I'm sure you'll enjoy those slides and lectures. And so I had two weeks. So I was praying and trying to figure out what can I do for two weeks. I can't do anything long and extended. And as I was in prayer, just reading Scripture and thinking about Scripture, uh, it kind of came to me that uh, explain to the church the period of time in preparation for the Incarnation, meaning what was going on in the world uh, before the Incarnation, before Jesus came, before all these things happened. Now, we know that there's a period of time that the Bible is silent, and that's called the intertestamental period, where it goes from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And in that period of time is a very interesting period of time because God is silent. It's the only time that God had been silent. And uh, God is silent for 400 years. And I wanted to explore a little bit what was going on during that 400-year period of time uh, and not give you a history lesson, but really give you a, a, a theological lesson on, on Scripture and try to paint a picture so when we celebrate the Advent season in preparation for God with us, right? God with us, Emmanuel with us, the birth of the God child, the incarnation, we understand that it was the perfect time. And the Apostle Paul, and I gave you a little bit of a clue to uh, what that was going to be. And the Apostle Paul understood uh, in, in the precise moment in time, the precise moment in all of world history and all of history of eternity, that God became flesh, spirit became flesh uh, through the incarnation of Christ. And that's why we all celebrate Christmas. Now, we may get distracted when we go into Home Depot or Lowe's and see all these Christmas decorations and the Christmas trees and all that, uh, we, get, we get distracted as to what Christmas is really about. And of course, nobody loved Christmas more than me. Uh, we had great Christmases with brothers and sisters and presents and all these wonderful things. And my mother would cook beautiful food and it was something to look forward to. Uh, but in all that, and those are beautiful memories that we have, and I'm sure you have memories like that also, uh, but most importantly, it's the incarnation of our Lord and Savior that's so important. And the Apostle Paul explains this, and I read this to you, and I'll read it again. It says this, but when the time had fully come, see, there's a precise moment in time in eternity when God chose to send his son. It was at that precise moment in eternity that God said, go, and the second person of the Trinity, the Son, in spirit, the Word became flesh and blood through the Incarnation, the transformative uh, Incarnation where the Holy Spirit fashioned bones and flesh and blood uh, for the baby that would be born in the manger. But when the time had fully come, and it's important that we understand these words fully come, there was a precise time, a precise moment, and it was planned by God. When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman. We know He was born through Mary, right? born under the law, under the Roman law, under the Jewish law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So Paul understood this, this prepar uh, preparatory time that God would eventually send his son. So uh, if you turn to your bulletin, uh, we'll read a portion of scripture. I'm not going to spend much time on the scripture. It's preparatory. It's from the book of Micah, and it prophesies uh, in the Old Testament this Messiah. And it says this, and see if this sounds familiar. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, though you were small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. And my suggestion is, as we read this, that we consider that when the Lord said, therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, that there's a period of time that God is silent, and that period of time is the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
And the question is, what is going on in that time period, and what relevance does that have for us today as we live? And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. I mean, that's what, you know, peace be with you, joy, peace, these are all the elements of, of traditional Christmases, but they have import, and they have biblical meaning and import, uh, and we will talk about that over the next few weeks. So, the last word spoken, uh, as I read to you from the book of Malachi, uh, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Now, we know that the Old Testament, the last Old Testament saint will, saint will meet him today. You may not know who that is, but you will after today. But the last words that God has spoken uh, through Scripture, through the canonized Scripture, is this. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. It says this. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day the Lord, of the Lord comes. Now, let me read that again. See... I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So those are the last words that are spoken in the Old Testament. And taking, uh, there's not a lot of context there, so trying to understand the import and significance of that is a little bit difficult until you find the first words that are spoken in the New Testament. Then it all makes sense. But the question is, what was going on? God spoke these words, and these are the last words that were spoken, and then 400 years of silence followed. And so when we talk about this and we look to this, we must try to determine what is going on. So uh, we'll give, I'll give you the answer to this shortly or uh, this week or next. But, you know, we make all these preparations for the holidays. You're probably starting to prepare for Christmas and Thanksgiving now, buying things, uh, getting things ready for these particular dinners. I mean, uh, the holiday season has come upon us very quickly. I've noticed already that the stores are starting to fill up. Uh, there's a lot of decorations already. It's not even Thanksgiving, and everything seems like it's almost decorated for Christmas already. Much of the stores and people are going out to dinner and lunches, and uh, it becomes more crowded. I noticed just going to the diner for lunch, the place was just filled, and it hasn't been filled in months. So it seems as though people are getting out more, people are buying, uh, people are preparing for the, the holiday season. So they're all making these special uh, preparations for whether it be Thanksgiving and, and then of course immediately after Thanksgiving uh, the Christmas season begins I guess uh, with the ending of Thanksgiving so uh, people make all these particular preparations for the holidays and for Christmas you know but but God made preparations for us so God made preparations God made preparations of all the earth for this Advent season and through this preparation uh, he gave the perfect gift to humanity, that being his son, that would redeem the world from its sin. So we know that the birth of Christ is such an important, maybe the most important in all of uh, the history, of, of world history, of eternal history, is this incarnation, this, this birth of the Messiah, this birth of Christ. But it's interesting that uh, these things were foreshadowed long ago. And we can go to the book of Genesis and we can see the beginning of, of God's plan unfolding about the Incarnation. I mean, even as far back as the Old Testament, the book found in Genesis. See, the Earth's first glimmer of the eternal Christ is seen in the opening book of Genesis, where God spoke to Satan. And he said this, I will put enemy between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. This is Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, one of the first and earliest uh, pronouncements of this this Messiah this Christ this is the first glimmer uh, of hope given to the world and we had to progress through uh, Adam and Eve and uh, Noah and Abraham and David and the Old Testament prophets and then it comes all the way to the minor prophets that we've that we've we don't really spend too much time on these minor prophets but uh, if you go to the back of the Old Testament you'll see Micah and Jonah and Malachi uh, and Zechariah and some of which are called the minor prophets and those are the lessening those are the last words that the Lord is speaking to the world and then 400 years of silence. So my question is this, what was going on 
during those 400 years of silence. And uh, I came across this, this, uh, this little joke. If I can find it, I'll, I'll read it to you. But it talked about uh, there was uh, these old guys. They were sitting on a porch. And I'm trying to see if I could find where I located this uh, little joke. But it was kind of, it was kind of a, a nice little uh, pronouncement of these old men. I can just set it up to you. I remember pretty, pretty clearly is that these old men are up in the country somewhere, and they're sitting on the porch, and they're all uh, drinking and just uh, relaxing and looking at the beautiful uh, nature that they have. It was probably in, in the woods of Kentucky or somewhere to that effect. Uh, and a visitor came, and the visitor came into the town and was uh, mingling with the people and trying to get his footing as to where he's going to stay, where he's going to live. Uh, and he came across these uh, old guys, uh, could have been Jay and Joe and uh, a few others sitting on the porch there, just kibitz and having some coffee or... Uh, something like that. But you get the picture. They're on the porch and they're having their coffee. Joe just made a fresh pot of uh, military coffee and Jay's there and they're all talking in kibitz and maybe there's a few others uh, uh, there too. Uh, and as they're talking in there, uh, the, the uh, visitor came in and says, uh, notice that nobody's really talking. Everyone's just sitting around being quiet. Uh, and he said, you know, I noticed that, uh, you know, I'm watching you guys sitting on the porch here for quite a bit of time and, and nobody's talking. Uh, and one of the old fellas turned to him and says, well, uh, we'd have to determine whether silence is better than the things that you're going to say to us. <laughs> and it's a good point that, you know, oftentimes we say so many foolish, stupid things that shouldn't be said that silence would be better than uh, most of the things that we say, right? And most of the things that society, maybe society should be a little bit more silent, like Jay and Joe on the, on the porch of that old house uh, out in the country there. But uh, God was silent, and we wonder, why was God silent? Now, uh, what I've written down is that I believe that God was silent for a few reasons. Number one, that uh, there was so much unbelief and rejection of God during that time period. So, uh, you know, God is not going to force feed us. Uh, not as gonna, God is not going to force feed humanity. Uh, at that time during the prophet Malachi, when he said these last words uh, of the Lord, that, see, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the uh, children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. Uh, I will come and strike the land with a curse, or I will come and strike the land with a curse. So uh, he's making preparation, but the world had rejected the Lord and the tenets of the Lord and the way, to God, the way that God wanted the people to live. They just rejected that, and God went silent. And as God went silent with these things, it makes you wonder why. Well, I think that, number one, the people's unbelief and rejection of God was one of the reasons God went silent, although he had a plan for it. But the second thing maybe is more important, that God had a preparation and plan to instill, and he needed the 400 years for the world to uh, find out what his plan was. So what was going on in the world? See, God uh, allowed this time to happen in that the world would be the proper time, and just at the particular moment in history, that's when the incarnation happened. But the preparation that God was allowing to be done during those 400 years of silence of the closing of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Uh, Alexander the Great came onto the world scene during that 400 years. So we have Alexander the Great come, came onto the world scene and he moved his conquer, conquering troops throughout the whole world and he set up cities and roads and libraries and schools and all these things. He, he, he brought culture and society fast forward a thousand years in that 400 years of time and all those things were important for the gospel of Christ to be proclaimed to the world. Having roads, having libraries, having schools, having people uh, educated so they can read and, and talk and write and all these things, that had to be accomplished in God's mind during that 400 years. As this happened, the cities would spread, libraries would spread, and what they were doing, they were spreading Greek culture and language all throughout the world. And then, of course, Rome came to power, and the Greek language, which we know the New Testament was written in Greek, became the universal language. More people were educated that dur during that time. There was more travel throughout the whole world at that, that point in time, and it prepared for this gospel to be translated uh, into, into uh, different languages, into the Greek, and then throughout the world. And then we know this, that the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament were finally translated into the Greek. So now what happened? Not only did the Jews know God's plan for the world, but now the Gentiles knew God's plan for the world by reading the Old Testament 
And then the Old Testament went throughout the world uh, in the Greek language and was being taught in places, was being spoken about, was being preached. Uh, so people were hearing this and understanding all this preparation that God was doing in the world of which we lived. So when, these, the, when the Jewish scriptures now were translated into the Greek, it opened up the world to the Gentiles. And then people would begin to understand uh, people not equated with the Jewish principles of faith, scripture, the Ten Commandments, all these things. Now they began to understand that God had an important role in fulfilling God's plan for redemption for the world. So all these things were going on. It was very important. But also, don't forget that God was also preparing the Jews for the coming of their Messiah. And he was setting the stage not only for the Messiah for the Jews, Messiah for the Gentiles, but the Messiah for the whole world. So this is why those 400 years of silence may be more important. It allowed the world time to catch up to God's plan. And God allowed all these things to happen. So we have, uh, we have this going on, and then all of a sudden, God speaks. So we know the last words spoken of in the Bible from the Old Testament are from Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. But the question is, what are the first words spoken in the New Testament? Can we find those words in Matthew? No. Can we find those words in, in Mark? No. Can we find those words in John? No. Can we find those words in Romans or Corinthians or all the other Ephesians or Colossians or... Uh, all the other books of the New Testament. No, the first words spoken after 400 years are spoken by Luke. And they're recorded by Luke. And what they are is foretelling of John the Baptist's birth. Those are the first words in 400 years to God. Why? Why would that be? I mean, Luke tells us in his gospel, uh, and, it, and I'll get to this, he writes... Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. So that's the introduction. But now the words spoken are this. In the time of Herod the king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense, when Zechariah saw him, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. So these are the first words that were spoken in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And it had to do with the birth of John the Baptist. And then when we go back to Malachi and we read, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy in Malachi. is now found in Luke. So John must hold the key to opening the New Testament and the preparation that God is making for the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So as we read this, we're excited that we can see the reason why Luke writes and puts John, the birth of John, foretold first and foremost, because he's familiar with the Old Testament, he knows what the Old Testament prophesied, and now the prophecy of Malachi has been fulfilled in the birth of John. Well, how did this birth come along? It's very interesting how this birth came along. So John the Baptist is born. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. 
He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And we know that when time came, the Lord said about John, Jesus said about John, no greater man hath ever lived than John the Baptist. No greater man. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. So even before Pentecost happened, John is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit of God as an Old Testament prophet. He's still considered an Old Testament prophet, even though he's mentioned in Luke's Gospel. Why? Because Christ had not come yet. Now, although Malachi was the last prophet to speak, and then there's 400 years of silence where silence spoke many words, the world was being prepared for the advent of the Son. Many people of Israel, he will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Well, that makes sense, right? Because in Malachi, it says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day. This is amazing how the Bible just lines up. It's not by accident that this lines up just perfectly and precisely. Only the mind of God could do this. You know, people say, oh, well, you know, Luke went back and knew about the scripture, and the first thing he wanted to do was to make sure that that scripture was fulfilled. Only the mind of God could do these things. And he says this, and he will go on before the Lord. He will go on before the Lord. Well, did John the Baptist go on before the Lord? Did he prepare the way of the Lord? Yes. He said, I am here to prepare the way of the Lord. I am not the Lord. He is. I'm not worthy to tie his sandals of his shoes. But God prepared the world, and God used John in that preparation. He will go on and before the Lord in the spirit of the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. That sounds familiar. That's quoted almost verbatim from Malachi. He, he will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. So this is the work of John the Baptist. Zechariah asked the angel, now this is all going on uh, in the temple. So Zechariah is a priest. Zechariah's wife Elizabeth is barren. They're praying for a child. Zechariah has to do his duty in the temple. He goes into the temple and then he meets the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? Well, that was the one mistake he made, <coughs> questioning God. You know, we, we question God all the time. There's no ramifications for that, right? But when, when Zechariah, the priest, questioned God, uh, it didn't go well for him. He said, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. How is she going to become pregnant? The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent here to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent. And not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Once again, the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. Well, he's lucky he didn't die, right? He probably came very close. When he came out, he couldn't speak. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. And then this is the funny part. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Mm -hmm. Then six months later, Jesus is born. So you have here the preparation that God was doing in the world. It wasn't just by happenstance that Christ came on December 25th or whatever day it, it may have been. I mean, that, they just kind of selected that day out of the air. But nevertheless, it's not important the day. It's important that we recognize and celebrate the most important event in human history, the incarnation of Jesus. So as the world prepares, as we prepare, and we see that those last words spoken from Malachi and we see these years of silence, these 400 years. And then we see God shattering his silence with the birth of John the Baptist, the foretelling of John the Baptist. Everything seems to be lining up perfectly. 
perfectly. So God is closing the Old Testament. He's opening up the New Testament, the new covenant for us. God spoke through his silence, and he continues to speak to us today. The heavens declare the glory of God. And he communicates us with us through the Holy Spirit, bearing witness to these things. The Lord speaks clearly through the Bible. He speaks clearly to our hearts and our minds if we allow him to share those things with us. When the time had fully come, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. See, God was preparing everything perfectly and precisely. It's not just by that day, December 25th, that God just, by luck, that happened. Everything had to be perfectly in place for this to have maximum effect. The will of God. The will of God happened, and the will of God happens to us. So that gives you a little bit of background as to what was going on from the Old Testament, the 400 years of silence, and then the New Testament opens with the foretelling of John the Baptist, who will. Look at what John did. What a tremendous, powerful, powerful witness he was for Jesus in preparation for Jesus. And, and John said this. He said this to everybody. He says, I must decrease as he must increase. None of this happened by accident or happenstance. So as you begin to prepare for the holiday season, you prepare for Thanksgiving by getting your food, decorating the house, all these things, know that God was well at work preparing for the incarnation that the world would be forever changed through Jesus Christ. And as society and culture are so consumed with, you know, the Santa Claus decorations, the reindeer decorations, and all this nonsense, it's fun, it's nice in its right place. But let us never forget the real reason for the season. And that is Emmanuel, right? Christ with us. The church needs to awake to these principles and let it be vital in our lives. Let it be like John the Baptist. Let the Holy Spirit that captured John the Baptist and captured him his whole life, let that same Spirit capture us in our lives. Let us live as though we are ministers and being transformed through the power of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can go back and look at these, this period of time that, where God was silent and yet God was at work. And maybe, Lord, that's a good example for us that when we pray and we think that God doesn't hear our prayer or answer our prayer or God is silent, maybe that's good for us to know that God is at work even in his silence. By faith, let us understand that although God may be silent, he is at work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Unless the ushers to come forward, we'll do communion.